going to discuss the Macedonian dynasty of the Byzantine Empire, which spanned between 862 to 1057 AD. The Byzantine Empire, or medieval Greece, embraced the Mediterranean world, the Hellenistic kingdoms of Alexander the Great's successors in the Roman Empire, and infused it with Orthodox Christianity. East and West met, fought, united, and fused with Hellenism, that Greek spirit that endured for millennia. A commonwealth of Byzantine states will eventually emerge in Eastern Europe, Russia being the most prominent. Though the Arab, Balkan, and Southern European world will be a direct part of this kingdom's hold, the torch of its high culture in the form of spirituality, science, and the arts will pass on to Western Europe. Byzantium's history spans over 1100 years, beginning with the founding of Constantinople by Constantine the Great in 330 AD, until the fall of Trebizond in 1461 AD. Nova Roma, or New Rome, as this new capital was called, was built on the old Greek city of Byzantium. This is the origin of the historiographical name for the Eastern Roman Empire, which self-identified simply as the Roman Empire. Constantine was the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity. He was of Greek descent born in the city of Nisus in modern-day Nice in Serbia. The Macedonian was the second longest reigning dynasty in Byzantine history. By the end of the reign of Basil II, it was the world's greatest superstate, and a cultural and theological golden age was fully underway. In power from the 9th to 11th centuries, this Macedonian renaissance witnessed not only the recapture of previously lost territories, but education as well as the arts flourished. Here are the Byzantine emperors of the Macedonian dynasty. We begin with Basil I, who ruled from 867 to 886 AD. Basil I, the Macedonian, was born from a peasant family in the theme of Macedonia. He rose in the imperial court rather quickly and usurped the throne from Emperor Michael III, who was the last ruler of the Amorian dynasty. Despite his humble origins, he showed great ability in running the affairs of state, leading to a revival of imperial power and a renaissance of Byzantine art. He was perceived by the Byzantines as one of the greatest emperors, and the Macedonian dynasty, which he founded, ruled over what is regarded as the most glorious and prosperous era of the Byzantine Empire. Because of the great legislative work which Basil I undertook, he is often called the Second Justinian. Basil's laws, written in Greek, were collected in the Basilica, consisting of 60 books and smaller legal manuals known as the Savoyi. His son, Leo VI, was responsible for completing these legal works. The Basilica remained the law of the Byzantine Empire down to its conquest by the Ottomans. On the missionary front, during the reign of Michael III and Basil I, two Greek monks from Thessaloniki in Macedonia set out to Christianize the Slavs. The saints Kyrlos and Methodius translated the Bible and other works into the language later known as Old Slavonic and invented the glycolytic alphabet. This Slavic alphabet is based on Greek characters that in its final Cyrillic form is still in use as the alphabet for modern Russian and a number of other Slavic languages. They are venerated in the Christian church with the title of Equal to the Apostles. Leo VI the Wise, or Sophos, ruled between 886 and 912. Educated by the patriarch Photios, Leo was more scholar than soldier. In addition to completing the canon of laws, he wrote several decrees on a wide range of ecclesiastical and secular problems. He also wrote a funeral panegyric on his father, liturgical poems, sermons and orations, secular poetry, and military treatises. Leo's image is in a mosaic over the central door of Hagia Sophia. During Leo's reign, the Russian prince Oleg sailed to Constantinople and in 907 obtained a treaty regulating the position of Russian merchants in Byzantium, which was formally ratified in 911. In the subject matter of legal works and treatises, he established a legal commission that carried out his father's original intent of codifying all existing Byzantine law. The result was a six-volume work consisting of 60 books entitled The Basilica. Written in Greek, The Basilica translated and systematically arranged practically all of the laws preserved 
in the Corpus Juris Civilis, thereby providing a foundation upon which all other Byzantine laws could be built. Leo then began integrating new laws during his reign into the Basilica. Alexander reigned as senior emperor for one year between 912 and 913. He was the younger brother of Leo VI and co-ruler throughout his reign, but did not actually participate in the government at all. He stopped paying tribute to the Bulgar Khan Simeon, which led to hostilities with the Bulgarians until the next decade. Constantine VII Porfirogenitos ruled between 913 and 959. Porfirogenitos means the purple born, an emperor or empress who is born in the purple marble paneled imperial bedchambers of Constantinople. There was a room in the imperial palace of Constantinople entirely lined with porphyry where reigning empresses gave birth. Constantine VII is best known for his four books, De Administrato Imperio, bearing in Greek the title Proston Idion Ion Romanon, De Ceremonis, Peritis Vasiliu Taxios, De Thematibus, Peri Thematon Anatolis Kedisios, and Vita Basili, Vios Vasiliu. These books gave advice on running the empire internally and on fighting external enemies. Constantine had active diplomatic relationships with foreign courts, including those of the Caliph of Cordoba, Abd Arrahman III, and Otto the I, Holy Roman Emperor. In the autumn of 957, Constantine was visited by Olga of Kiev, regent of the Kievan Rus. She was baptized a Christian with the name Helena, and she sought missionaries to encourage her people to adopt Christianity. According to legends, Constantine VII fell in love with Olga, however, she found a way to refuse him by tricking him to become her godfather. When she was baptized, she said it was inappropriate for a godfather to marry his goddaughter. Olga would become a very influential ruler and she would unite the Kievan Rus and eventually influence her grandson Vladimir to accept Christianity, which we will discuss a little bit later. Next we have Romanos I Le Capenos, who ruled between 920 and 944. An admiral of lowly origin, Romanos rose to power as a protector of the young Constantine VII against the general Leo Focas the Elder. After becoming the emperor's father-in-law, he successively assumed higher offices until he crowned himself senior emperor. His reign was marked by the end of warfare with Bulgaria and the great conquest of John Kurkuas. John Kurkuas was one of the most important generals of the Byzantine Empire. Kurkuas' success in battles against the Muslim states in the east reversed the course of the centuries-long Byzantine-Arab wars and began Byzantium's 10th century Age of Conquest. Romanos II Porfirogenitos became emperor between 959 and 963. He was the only surviving son of Constantine VII Porfirogenitos. He ruled until his own death, although the government was led mostly by the eunuch Joseph Bringas. His reign was marked by successful warfare in the east against the Hamdanid dynasty and the recovery of Crete by General Nikephoros Phokas. His wife, the Empress Stefano, plays a crucial role in our story as well. Tafano was born of Laconian Greek origin in the Peloponnesian region of Laconia, possibly in the city of Sparta in 941. Tafano was originally named Anastasia and was the daughter of a poor tavern keeper called Krateros. Tafano was renowned for her great beauty and higher apparent Romanos fell in love with her around the year 956 and married her against the wishes of his father, Emperor Constantine VII. Romanos and Tafano had three children together. Basil II, Constantine Porfirogenitos, and Anna Porfirogenita, who later married the Russian prince Vladimir. Nikiforos Fokas became emperor after Romano's death with the help of Romano's widow, Theofano. In return for her hand, the childless Nikiforos gave his sacred pledge to protect her children and their interests. Nikiforos II Fokas ruled between 963 and 969. A brilliant military leader, his exploits in the 10th century contributed to the resurgence of the empire, restoration of Christian life in Crete and Cyprus, and defeat of the Muslim forces that had subdued much of the Christian land in the eastern Mediterranean area. He was the most successful general of his generation. 
As emperor, Nikephoros issued laws that restricted the growth of ecclesiastical property, as he believed that wealth did not fit with the spiritual nature of the church and the ascetic lifestyle of monastics. In the summer of 964, he continued his campaigns against the Arabs in the east, mounting an offensive through Cappadocia. His incredible track record on the battlefield earned him the nickname the Pale Death of the Saracens. In 965, he captured Tarsus, then freed the region of Cilicia. Meanwhile, his general Nikitas Halkudzis freed Cyprus from Arab domination. However, the attempt to free the Greek population of Sicily failed. His campaigns of 967 in the west were not as successful, or out of the first made himself the western emperor and attacked the possessions of Constantinople in Italy. John I Jemiskis ruled between 969 and 976. A nephew of Nikephoros Phokas, he was an intuitive and successful general who strengthened the empire and expanded its borders during his short reign. He fell out with his uncle though and led a conspiracy of disgruntled generals who murdered him. John was acclaimed emperor and at the demand of Patriarch Polyevkos banished Theophano, Nikephoros widow, to the princess islands in the Sea of Marmara near Constantinople. Even though they started out as lovers, he was pressured by the church to marry another. He married Theodora, a daughter of Constantine VII, which associated him with the Macedonian dynasty. Theodora was one of the sisters of Romanos II, Theophano's first husband. John became regent for the young sons of Romanos II, Basil and Constantine. In 971, he succeeded in expelling Sviatoslav, the prince of Kiev, from the Balkans. He extended Byzantine control farther into Bulgaria during this campaign, renaming the capital Ioannupolis and capturing the Bulgarian Tsar Boris. Activities on the Eastern Front were similarly expansive. He conquered Antioch, Armenia, and sent a large offensive into Syria in 975 that made John the first emperor to visit the region since Heraclius almost 350 years earlier. John continued to defend the poor against the Dinati the strong. He greatly improved relations with the Western Empire by agreeing to the marriage alliance that Nikephoros had rejected. In 972, John's niece Theophano married the German Emperor Otto II. John unexpectedly fell ill and died in 976 though, leaving the government in the hands of Basil de Capenos and the infant Basil II and Constantine VIII. Today it's Imiski Street, the main commercial road in the center of Thessaloniki, is named after him. Basil II Porphyrogenitus. Basil the Bulgar Slayer, or Basil the Vulgaroctonus in Greek, was born between 957 and 958 and died on December 15, 1025. He was emperor between 976 to 1025 and extended imperial rule in the Balkans, notably Bulgaria, Mesopotamia, Georgia, and Armenia, and increased his domestic authority by attacking the powerful landed interests of the military aristocracy and of the church. 
His rule is widely considered as the apogee of medieval Byzantium. Basil was the son of Romanos II and Theophano, and was crowned co-emperor with his brother Constantine, but as minors both he and his brother remained in the background. After the father's death in 963, the government was effectively undertaken by the senior military emperors, first by Nikiforos II Phokas, their stepfather, and then by John I Dumiskis. On the latter's death in 976, the powerful great uncle of Basil II, the eunuch Basil the Chamberlain, took control. His authority in that of Basil II was challenged by two generals who coveted the position of senior emperor, Bardas Phokas and Bardas Kleros. Both related to emperors, they belonged to powerful landed families and commanded outside support from Georgia and from the Caliph in Baghdad. After a prolonged struggle, both were defeated by 989, though only with the help of the Russians under Vladimir of Kiev. He was rewarded with the hand of Basil II's sister Anna on condition that the Kievan state adopted Christianity. Certain Russian soldiers remained in Basil II's service, forming the famous imperial Varangian Guard. Basil II aimed slowly at the extension and consolidation of imperial authority at home and abroad. The main fields of external conflict were in Syria, Armenia and Georgia on the Eastern Front, in the Balkans and in Southern Italy. He maintained a Byzantine position in Syria against aggression stirred up by the Fatimid dynasty in Egypt and on occasion made forced marches from Constantinople across Asia Minor to relieve Antioch. By diplomacy he secured land from Georgia and also expanded Byzantine control over most of Armenia. He is however best known for his persistent and ultimately successful campaigns against a revived Bulgarian kingdom under its Tsar Samuel. This ruler centered his activities in Macedonia and established his hegemony in the West Balkans. From 986 until 1014 there was warfare between Byzantium and Bulgaria interrupted from time to time by Basil II's intermittent expeditions to settle crises on the Eastern Front. Basil II enlisted Venetian help in protecting the Dalmatian coast and Adriatic waters from Bulgarian aggression. Year by year, he slowly penetrated into Samuel's territory, campaigning in winter as well as summer. Finally, holding central and northern Bulgaria, he advanced towards Samuel's capital, Ohrida, and won the crushing victory that gave him the byname Slayer of the Bulgars. It was then that he blinded the whole Bulgarian army numbering 15,000 soldiers, leaving one eye to each 100th man so that the soldiers might be led back to their Tsar, who died shortly after seeing this terrible spectacle. Thus the revived Bulgarian kingdom was incorporated into the Byzantine Empire. Basil then looked farther west and planned to strengthen Byzantine control in southern Italy and to regain Sicily from the Arabs. He attempted to establish a Greek Pope in Rome, Pope John XVI, and to unite in marriage the German, though by birth half Greek, Otto III, with Basil II's favorite niece, Zoe. As we will learn later, Otto III's dad, Otto II, had married the niece of John Zimisky Stefano. Both schemes failed, but he was more successful in southern Italy, where order was restored, and at his death preparations were being made for the reconquest of Sicily. The Macedonian Renaissance was taking effect, seeing the rise of classical scholarship being assimilated into Christian art and the study of ancient philosophy. The studies of these will greatly expand the library of the University of Constantinople, assisted by the enlargement projects by the emperors, establishing itself as the main source of learning for its day once again. The university was free for all. Though not a man of literature, Basil was a relatively pious ruler involving himself in the construction of churches, monasteries, and even to some extent cities. By 1025, Basil II was able to amass 14,400,000 nomismata, that's over 200,000 pounds of gold for the imperial treasury due to his prudent management. By the standards of any period, that is a lot of money. Next, we come to the second son of Romanos II, Constantine Porfirogenitos, who was born in 960 and raised to co-emperor in March 962. During the rule of Basil II, he spent his time in idle pleasure. He gave full authority to Basil. Most importantly, his two daughters, Zoe and Theodora, will carry on the family's legacy. Then we have a few more emperors and empresses, which uh, I will just briefly mention which hopefully we will discuss at a later time.
Romanos III Argyros, Michael IV the Paphlagonian, Michael V Kalafatis, Zoe and Theodora, Constantine IX Monomachos, Theodora again, Michael VI Bringas, and we will also learn about Michael Psellas, the historian, next time. I also want to give you a few more names which are very important to our story. Vladimir the Great, or Saint Vladimir, was a Grand Prince of the Kievan Rus. He was born in 958 and died on the 15th of July in 1015. He was a Prince of Novgorod, Grand Prince of Kiev, and ruler of Kievan Rus from 980 to 1015. Vladimir was the son of Zviatoslav of Kiev and Malusha. Following the death of his father, Vladimir was embroiled in a civil war with his brothers, which he won. By 980, Vladimir had consolidated the Kievan realm from modern-day Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine to the Baltic Sea and had solidified the frontiers against incursions of Bulgarian, Baltic tribes, and Eastern nomads. Vladimir converted to Greek Orthodox Christianity in 988 by marrying Anna Porfiroyanita, the sister of Emperor Basil II, and Christianized the Kievan Rus. Anna Porfiroyenita was born on March 13, 963, and died in 1011. She was a Grand Prince Consort of Kiev. She was married to Grand Prince Vladimir the Great. Anna was the daughter of Byzantine Emperor Romanos II and Theophano. She was also the sister of Basil Bulgaroktonos and Constantine VIII. Anna was a Porfiroyenita, a legitimate daughter born in the special purple chamber of the Byzantine Emperor's palace. Anna's hand was considered such a prize that some theorized Vladimir became Christian just to marry her. Anna did not wish to marry Vladimir at first and expressed deep distress on her way to her wedding. Grand Prince Vladimir was impressed by Byzantine religious practices. This factor, along with his marriage to Anna, led to his decision to convert to Greek Orthodox Christianity. Due to these two factors, Grand Prince Vladimir also began Christianizing his kingdom. Here comes the famous story of when he sent emissaries to the world to discover the great religions. When his emissaries went to the capital of Constantinople and saw the church of the Hagia Sophia, they told him this is where God lives. The religion of the Greeks is what we must follow. Although many sources vary, Anna and Vladimir did fall in love on a peace treaty to Hersonisos in the Crimea. At first she didn't like him, but they began to grow and love each other and influence each other in their respective countries and civilizations. By marriage to Grand Prince Vladimir, Anna became Grand Princess of Kiev, but in practice she was referred to as Queen or Tsarina, as a sign of her membership of the Imperial Byzantine House. Anna participated actively in the Christianization of Rus, she acted as the religious advisor of Vladimir and founded a few converts and churches herself. Scholars have pointed to evidence that she and Vladimir may have had as many as three children together, including Boris and Gleb. And last, I wanted to mention her cousin Theophano, who was also Basil II's niece. She was born in 955 and died June 15, 990 AD. She was an empress consort of the Holy Roman Empire by marriage to Holy Roman Emperor Otto II and region of the Holy Roman Empire during the minority of her son from 983 until her death in 990. She was the niece of the Emperor John I Dimiskis. Her name is derived from medieval Greek, Theophania, appearance of God, or Theophany. Her father and mother, though, are a bit of a mystery, but it was probably Constantine Skleros and Sophia Fokena, although highly unlikely, even Romanos II and Theophana were rumored to be her parents. Theophano was not the purple-born princess the Ottonians would have preferred. In fact, as the Saxon chronicler Bishop Tithmar of Merseburg writes, the Ottonian preference was Anna Porfiroyenita, the daughter of the late Romanos II. But she was off to marry Vladimir, so obviously that did not happen. Theophano's uncle Emperor John I Dimiskis was considered the usurper of the Byzantine throne, placing Theophano in a precarious position. The match was ultimately made, Theophano married Otto II and had one son, Otto III, and three daughters, 
Adelaide I, Sophia I, and Mathilde. Stefano brought Greek culture and civilization to the Carolingian German court, also known as the Ottonian dynasty, and most importantly introduced the fork. That is an interesting tidbit that before the fork, the Germans ate with their hands, and until Stefano brought it with her, which was her favorite culinary utensil, they actually made fun of her. Stefano was also criticized for her relative decadence, which was displayed in her bathing more than once and introducing new luxurious garments and jewelry into the royal court. So there you have it. In a nutshell, this is the Macedonian dynasty. Uh, in the future, I hope to be able to uh, introduce to you the rest of the emperors and empresses on our, on our list, because these were just a few of the highlighted individuals. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show, and we're looking forward to making some more of these. Thank you very much. The year is 988 AD, Emperor Basil II rules over Byzantium. His reign has ushered a second golden age for Greece, but a civil war threatens to destroy the empire from within. Can Russian Grand Prince Vladimir become an ally? Will Greece survive? Will love be strong enough to overcome that which sword and shield cannot? This is the story of Anna and Vladimir, the love that rocked the world. Porfirio Grishian Rock Opera, Anna and Vladimir the Love That Rocked the World, is on its way to Broadway. That's how I see it in a few years. Chronicles the story of Princess Anna Porfirogenita of Byzantium and Prince uh, Vladimir the Great of the Kievan Rus. It's their story, their love story, how they got together uh, for political strife, from war in their respective countries and how they helped unite both of their civilizations.
We take in stories from the Russian Primary Chronicle and we flesh them out to create a beautiful musical landscape and a narrative. So the wedding of Anna Porfirogenita and Vladimir, which is mentioned uh, in a book, is not mentioned in other history books. It's, it's a rare thing and, and I took it out and I fleshed it out and I made it into a sort of reality. You know, this is how Anna and Vladimir met. I have a love for history, especially Byzantine history, Russian history, uh, and the year 988 AD, which is where this takes place, is one of my favorite eras. It involves uh, Basil II of Byzantium, it involves uh, the, the Russians, uh, Vikings, so many different narratives that fit into this particular uh, moment in history and it's how the, the Russians became Christian and they accepted Greek Orthodox Christianity and joined the Byzantine Commonwealth which is also very important to everybody and to the Greeks themselves and to the Russians and the whole world. It's a, it's a moment in time that changed the world. And Anna and Vladimir, these two heroes, helped shape the future of mankind. <laughs> Rock and roll and uh, hard rock and heavy metal are my passions. I've always mixed them with uh, traditional music, Greek ethnic, Mediterranean music, uh, Eastern European, Slavic, Russian. I want to showcase something epic. You can only either showcase it through classical music, through folklore music, or through heavy metal. There is nothing else to, to make an epic grand story. And um, I've always believed in this. And uh, Carnegie Hall, Off-Broadway, communities the past three years have been falling in love with our story. So we're doing something right.
Porfira, a Grecian rock opera, Anna and Vladimir, the love that rocked the world, is on its way to Broadway. We are a UNESCO awarded production and a registered nonprofit 501c3 organization, which means all your contributions will be tax deductible. Please help us on our journey. Thank you for your time. Don't let them steal our dreams